interested. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. We're over in the book of Exodus, chapter 13 today. Very uh, exciting portion of Scripture as we once again look into God's Word. Now, you probably have forgotten what we've been studying in Exodus by this time because we had a lot of very special specials in between. On We had Palm Sunday, fig branches, palm trees, and whips. Then we had Good Friday hanging on a tree. Then we had Resurrection Sunday with three messages, Why Seek the Living Among the Dead, Faith in the Better Resurrection, Marriage in the Resurrection. The last two weeks we've had special speakers. I was in Texas on the 10th, of course, with my mother for her 95th birthday. And so we had Reverend Keith Coleman, and then last Sunday we had our Mission Sunday with uh, Reverend Evan Yoon from the Bible College of East Africa. So we've had quite a few interruptions in the series in the book of Exodus, but today we are over in Exodus chapter 13, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 16. I hope as I read it to you, you began to realize some of the things that always go on at Passover time among the Jews. And so I think it's quite appropriate that we are studying this section of the Exodus dealing with the Passover and the events surrounding the departure of the children of Egypt, of Israel from Egypt. As you're probably aware, Passover began last night at sundown and will end next Saturday at sundown. The reason that the Jews are celebrating Passover as we speak is because of the commandment of God given in Exodus chapter 12 and then continued and restated again in our text today in Exodus chapter 13. The Jews were supposed to celebrate the Passover forever in every generation and in every location. The last time we studied Exodus, we looked at the last 12 verses of chapter 12. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass. God is a God of precision, is he not? The day that they came in was the day that they went out 430 years later. That all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is the night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. God laid down the rule, and that's why the Jews today, 3,450 years later, are still celebrating the Passover. Think of that. Over 3,400 years, every year, there have been Jews someplace in the world celebrating the Passover like they're doing today. And they don't know that their Passover lamb has come. Jesus Christ, Paul tells us, is our Passover, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Pray that God will open the eyes of Israel. That he will still call out from among them those who are his chosen because a time of great tribulation is coming prophesied in scripture. Worse than the Holocaust, worse than the Russian pogroms, worse than the Polish pogroms, worse than all the persecutions the Jews had under the Babylonians and under the Assyrians and under every other nation of the world. Pray that God will open their eyes today that Jesus is their Passover. As Paul says, my heart's prayer and desire to God is that Israel might be saved. Well, back to our text. It came to pass the selfsame day, verse 51, that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. So as we finished up chapter 12, we listed some of the principal things that a wise man will do 
when he sees the evil day approaching. You remember Proverbs says it twice, Proverbs 22.3 and Proverbs 27 verse 12, exactly the same words, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Again in verse 12 of chapter 27, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. We saw the lessons that were taught to us back in chapter 12. In particular, we saw what a people should do in preparation for the judgment of God that is about to fall on any nation. And as you know, I think that is about to happen here in the United States. We also learned what the children of Israel failed to do in preparation. Specifically, we saw how God gave certain things to them in the Passover narrative to remind them about these failures so that it wouldn't happen again when national judgment falls as it will during the Great Tribulation period. And here are some of the things we learned. First, as we looked at that first Passover, they took the food that they had when they left Egypt. The people took the dough before it was leavened. Preparation for national disaster requires food. God didn't start providing manna that night. That didn't happen for a very long time, already after they were across the Red Sea and into the wilderness. Number two, it appears that they really didn't expect the judgment to fall and deliverance to happen. You know, I'm afraid that's much like the church today. We sit here sort of in a stupor, in our sullen lethargy, complaining about things, not realizing the judgment is about to fall and we will fall prey to it if we are not prepared. They had to take the dough before it was leavened. They hadn't really prepared even one day in advance for what was about to happen. How far have you prepared in advance? You know, when the first couple of plagues came, they probably, you know, were all excited about it. But then as the plagues continued and Pharaoh didn't change, they just sort of settled back into their regular old day-by-day -day routines. You see things happening in the United States, bang, 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 one after another. And everybody's all excited at first, and now sort of everybody is just sort of slunking back and thinking, oh, well, that's the way it is. And we don't realize it's a prelude to judgment. Third, they not only took food, but they took the means for preparing food. They took their kneading troughs. If national disaster hit today, would you have any means to prepare food that, you didn't, that didn't depend on public utilities? If you have a fireplace, and that's probably not true in this area anyway, have you split wood for cooking? Or do you just buy expensive cords of wood when you want to have a pretty fire and roast s'mores and marshmallows at Christmas time? What portable means do you have for preparing food for yourself and your family if you had to flee for your life on a moment's notice? Fourth, they took clothing. And you know, they didn't have a lot, but they picked up some on the way. They got all kinds of nice stuff from the Egyptians. Verse 34 says, being bound up in their clothes upon their backs. Their clothing was a backpack. And you know what? Because they did, they made it out. And God made their clothing last. You know, as we read later on in the text, they walked for 40 years in the same set of sandals, and their sandals never wore out. How would you like to have a pair of shoes like that? Now, of course, the ladies who like to buy dozens of pairs of shoes probably wouldn't like that. They wouldn't want to wear the same pair of shoes over and over and over and over again for 40 years. But it worked. God performed a miracle of the shoes. Their shoes never wore out. Fifth, and perhaps this is one of the most important lessons that we learned from that text immediately preceding our text today, is the Israelites obeyed the word of God through Moses exactly, precisely, to the letter. You know, we've been studying that particular principle for many weeks. If you want God's blessing, you need to learn to obey him exactly exactly as he has commanded. You don't try to manipulate it. You don't try to change it a little bit. You don't try to make it more comfortable for yourself. You obey him exactly the way he has declared it. In this particular passage, they got blessed financially. They had an enforced multi-generational savings account with immediate withdrawal privileges in the case of a bank failure. They'd been slaves for almost 400 years, ever since the death of Joseph. God was merely paying them for their own labors and the labor of their ancestors with compound interest. Exact obedience made them rich. 
chapter 12, verse 35, And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and of raiment. That brought us into a short discussion of one of the basic financial principles of the New Testament, which is the no debt principle, being debt free. The Jews were debt free because they were slaves, but God blessed them with wealth from that point on, and they are still some of the wealthiest people in the world today. Because on this one particular night, on one night, that was the key that opened the door to their wealth. On this one night, they obeyed him precisely, word for word, in everything, exactly what he told them to do. Now let me make an application to that, because day by day we make all kinds of compromise choices. We do all kinds of things and think, oh well, it doesn't matter, it's only a little thing. They could have said the same thing that night. They could have just sort of obeyed him. But they obeyed him precisely. You know, you never know. Here's the application. You never know what obedience on one specific item or one specific time will result in for yourself and for all of your descendants. You don't know whether or not it's that door or this door or this door, but God says choose that door and you say, well, I like the middle door better rather than that one over there on the right. So you choose the middle door and you don't get the blessing. You choose that door that didn't look so hot, looked sort of a shabby kind of a door, it looked kind of ragged and crummy and maybe it even looked painful and maybe you heard some, some animal sounds on the other side of it and you said, I'm not going to go through that door. But if you had opened that door, you do not know what God would have had for you had you obeyed Him precisely. The children of Israel obeyed precisely on that night. They did exactly what God told them to do. They left in haste. They bound everything up just like He told them to do. They borrowed the money from their neighbors and they started running toward the sea. Which was a fairly stupid thing to do because you cannot walk across 118 miles of water. The Red Sea is 118 miles wide at that point. It's a point opposite Saudi Arabia. Because Paul tells us that Mount Sinai was in Arabia. Not in the Sinai Peninsula, in Arabia. They didn't wander through marshes. They didn't get stuck in the mud with Pharaoh's chariots trying to chase them. They crossed into Arabia where Mount Sinai is located according to the New Testament. And the Red Sea is 118 miles wide at that point. It looked impossible, but they obeyed God precisely. And what blessing it brought. Next time you're tempted to compromise, next time you're tempted to not obey God exactly like he said, but sort of change it to make it fit your rationale, remember, one small obedience at one precise point in history resulted in incredible, intense blessing for generations. Ah, oh, that we would learn that. You see, God judges to the third and fourth generation, but he blesses to the thousandth generation. We find that stated for us at least three major times in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 20, is which is the giving of the law. Uh, again, we find, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, speaking of idols, nor serve them. For the Lord thy God, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So, the bad things happen to the third and fourth generation of the people who hate God. Be glad that God cuts it off at that point. But listen to what it says in verse 6, because it's talking about the generations. And showing mercy unto the thousands of them, that is unto the thousand generations of them that love me and keep my commandments. He talks about it again in Exodus 34, keeping mercy for thousands involving uh, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, again, he talks about those who hate him in the third and fourth generation, they're going to experience results, but those who love him unto the thousandth generation of those who love him and keep his commandments. That's obedience to the Word of God. 
Now back to that principle I was talking about a minute ago. If you're debt free, you'll be able to leave either at the rapture or if you have to flee persecution with no chains of slavery binding you to earth or binding your children after you. You're not rich just because you have a lot of stuff. Remember, anything that you owe money on does not belong to you. It belongs to the bank. It belongs to the lender until you pay the last miserable cent. You're using it right now, but it doesn't belong to you as long as you owe money on it. They can repossess it. Just try missing a couple of car payments and see what happens. You know, if you won't bring it back to them, they actually send out people who get into your car and drive it away. It doesn't belong to you. They can take it from you anytime they want. The New Testament puts the command to be debt free in a triple negative. Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. In Greek, there are three negatives in there. Don't, no, not by any means, never owe anything to anybody. That's pretty powerful. One negative is enough. A double negative is really strong. A triple negative, which is very rare in the New Testament, means don't ever do it. Ever, ever, ever. Not even once. It's interesting that this is one of the first commands that Paul gives to the Christians at Rome right after chapter 12, which we looked at, you remember, weeks ago. We were going through the presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice and all the different things that are listed there, all the different principles, all the different uh, categories of things that Paul gives to us in Romans 12 for the Christian life. In Romans chapter 13, the first thing he talks about is be debt free. That's a rather practical principle, I think. It will make your life different if you obey that. It means you'll get out of debt, you'll remain out of debt, you'll be debt free. Now, please note, do not abuse this principle or try to abuse it. Never try to use it in an attempt to manipulate God like the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel people do. This principle does not mean just because you've obeyed exactly doesn't mean you're going to get rich. This principle does not mean that exact obedience will make you rich like it did the Jews. The heroes of faith listed in Hebrews chapter 11 are not only known for their greatness, but they are also known for their suffering. You recall that on Resurrection Sunday, called Easter by the World, the morning message was entitled, Faith and the Better Resurrection. Our text was Hebrews 11:35, and notice what follows immediately on the heels of that verse of that verse 35. I'll read verse 35 and then the rest. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Some heroes of faith don't get rich. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. You can join the list of the heroes of faith. We all want to join in the first half of the list where everybody got good stuff. But you know, as we move toward the end of this age, we're moving into the last half of Hebrews chapter 11, where the heroes of faith prove they are heroes of faith because they are willing to give all for Jesus, even though it costs them everything. That's the part we're living in. Last half, Hebrews 11, and we don't want it. But the true heroes of faith will live it. That brings us to the new material that we didn't have time to cover in the last two messages. Number six, the sixth fundamental principle taught at the point of the Exodus is this. God always makes the law of harvest apply in five specific areas. Here they are. Number one, the law of harvest applies to our actions. The law of harvest applies to our thoughts. The law of harvest applies to our words. The law of harvest applies to our motives. The law of har harvest applies to our attitudes, and it is without fail. You sow the wrong thing, you're going to reap some painful consequences. 
Then it's rather interesting that that results in seven key principal areas or applications in each of those areas for a total minimum of 35 different possible combinations. I'm not going to run through all of them for you today, but I'll give you how you can decide for yourself, how you can test what's happening in your life. When you look at the law of harvest, those are the five areas, actions, thoughts, words, motives, and attitudes. And then when you have the seven different applications applied to each of those areas, and I'm going to give those to you in just a second for as they relate to the law of harvest. But first, remember verses 35 and 36. The children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. They borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Remember, the Israelites had worked as slaves for almost 400 years. Ever since Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph, they had not been paid fair wages. You know, God doesn't tolerate it when the world treats his people that way. And they're all going to pay for it someday. Look at how they've treated Christians over the history of the world. Look at how they've treated the Jews over the history of the world. God doesn't tolerate it that way. But you know, God doesn't tolerate it when Christians treat other Christians that way. God doesn't tolerate it when Christian employers treat their employees that way, with haughty arrogance, with oppression and minimal wages for hard work. God doesn't tolerate it when Christian husbands treat their wives and children that way. God doesn't tolerate it when churches treat their pastors that way. God opposed the fact that Egypt failed to pay the Jews a fair wage. He not only paid the Jews their fair wages in those verses, but remember, he paid the Egyptians the fair results of their abuse of the Jews, the ten plagues. Not to mention the fact that he exacted from the Egyptians an enormous amount of wealth the night of the Passover. We've done extensive study of the law of harvest in the past, so I won't repeat all of that here. But let me just remind you of the seven key principles of the law of harvest. Here they are. Gonna, I hope you're taking notes. You want to write these things down. The five areas of the law of harvest, all the different things that it applies to. Now we're going to see what the principles are when we apply the law of harvest. So here are the seven key principles of the law of harvest, which when multiplied by five, that is the specific areas in which the law of harvest applies, produce a minimum of 35 different possible combinations. Of course, that increases exponentially if you're sowing in multiple areas of the five specific areas of thoughts, words, actions, attitudes, and motives. But here they are, seven key principles of the law of harvest in a nutshell. Number one, the kind of crop that you sow is the kind of crop that you will reap. You sow wheat, you get wheat. You sow barley, you get barley. You sow oats, you get oats. You sow sin, you're going to be the recipient of sinful actions by others. You sow righteousness, you will receive righteousness. So the kind of crop is number one. The season. The season is number two. The season in which you sow determines the season in which you reap. If you sow in the spring of your life, you're going to start reaping very soon. You know, you can even sow in the winter of your life and you're still going to reap a crop. Remember that. Number three, the amount that you sow, the amount that you sow determines the amount that you will reap. You sow a little bit, you reap a little bit. You sow a lot, you reap a lot. But you know what? You may sow one grain of seed and it'll produce one plant, but the one plant produces many, many, many seeds. So it always multiplies no matter how little you sow. So better sow the right thing. If you sow weeds, you may only sow one weed seed. And those of you who are trying to pull up dandelions at this season of the year know that it doesn't take very many of those little puffy things that go floating off you know, when the wind blows, it only takes one to grow another plant that's producing millions of these things. The amount you sow determines the amount you reap. And the more you sow, of course, you're going to really, really reap multiple crop the next season around. Number four, the location. The location in which you sow determines the location in which you reap. Number five, the realm 
the realm in which you sow determines the realm in which you reap. For example, you sow in the physical realm, you reap in the physical realm. You sow in the spiritual realm, you reap in the spiritual realm. Paul talks about that in the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Number six, the people. The people with whom you sow determines the people with whom you reap. For example, your children. You know, there are a lot of folks today who wonder why there is so much press for euthanasia from younger generations. Older generations didn't have respect for the sanctity of human life. That's at the beginning of life, and now they're at the end of life. And the generation that actually managed to survive all the abortions is now turning around saying, let's kill the old people. Number seven, the quality of the crop you sow, the quality of the crop you sow determines the quality of the crop that you reap. Or as the old computer saying, garbage in, garbage out. Galatians 6, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, that is, in sowing good crops. For in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. You've got to hang in there long enough to reap, if you're sowing good crops. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. He tells you one of the things that you can do in terms of your sowing. That's verse 10. We sort of just pass over it. Most of the times we read that passage, but as a side note, he says... As you have opportunity, therefore, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Notice the emphasize, emphasis on doing good to other believers in particular. I'm not making that up. The word that's translated especially there, especially unto them who are the household of faith, that's other believers. That's the Greek word malista. That's a defining word. In English, we use the phrase, what I mean to say, or... By that I mean to say is what's contained in that little word, melista. Therefore, let us do good unto men, by that I mean to say, unto them who are of the household of faith. A lot of tr people try to pull this out of context and make it into a do-gooder verse, but that's not what it says. It's a verse specifically speaking of doing beneficial good to other Christians. That's one, in fact, that's the primary illustration that the Apostle Paul gives in that section about the law of harvest as to how to make sure that you're reaping a good harvest. Another thing we need to remember, because it certainly relates to what's happening in our text today. Remember, the law of harvest relates to works, not to grace. The law of harvest relates to works, not to grace. The grace of God can break into the law of harvest and save us in spite of our evil ways. But you must never abuse the grace of God just because God is able to break into the cycle of destruction. Grace is not, as Paul very clearly states, grace is not a license to commit sin. Romans 6, what shall I say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The law of harvest is the basis for legal judgment. That is the judgment of works. What you sow, you reap. What you sow, you reap. That's legal. That's a legal judgment. That's a judgment of works. We find that, for example, in Revelation 20, verses 10 and 11. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now we're going to get the law of harvest. It's a legal judgment. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's not grace, folks. We're talking about the great white throne judgment. These are all the people who have not trusted Christ. These are all the people who have not had their sins forgiven. The dead are going to be judged according to their works. That's law, not grace. 
And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What are you sowing? The seven different applications, we just looked at them. The five different areas, we just looked at them. Let's look at some of the key verses in our text for today. We're back in Exodus 13 now. Verses 1 and 2, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb, that is, the very first one that comes out of the womb, that's the one that opens the womb, among the children of Israel, both of man and beast. Oh, these next three words. It's not a request. It's a statement of fact. It's not a, I hope you do this for me. It's a statement of, this is mine. It doesn't matter what you think about it. It is mine. Three words. The firstborn. It is mine. God didn't ask them for it. He told them about it. He told them to whom it belonged. It belonged to him. You know, this not only was to occur on that first Passover, but it was to occur perpetually in Israel, even when they were in pagan lands. Look at verses 11 through 13. Verse in Exodus 13 again. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites. That's a pagan land. As he sware unto thee and to thy fathers and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix. That's the one, the first one that's born. The one that opens the womb for many others that may follow. But the one that openeth the matrix and every first thing that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the males shall be the Lord's. And every first thing of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, because the, the ass, the donkey, was an unclean animal. It had to be redeemed, just like you and I are unclean and have to be redeemed. If you don't redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children thou shalt redeem, because it's teaching a lesson about the coming Redeemer who would redeem us. Setting apart the firstborn and giving it to the Lord was a reminder to them that God killed the firstborn in Egypt. So Passover becomes a dramatic reenactment as a sober reminder to each oldest child in the family that that child would have been dead were it not for the shed blood of a lamb. The oldest child is the one that carries on the family name, the family heritage, the family tradition, the birthright, the paternal blessing, the patriarchal authority, double inheritance, and many other things in the Old Testament all belong to the firstborn. All of that would have been cut off except for the Passover lamb. <laughs> As we say, that should scare the socks off of every firstborn. God starts by killing off the top. But God made provision for redeeming the firstborn through the blood of lambs. Verse 14. God knew that the kids would ask their parents, what are you doing? Why are you doing this thing? Verse 14, it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this that thou shalt say unto him? Here's a teachable moment, folks. They ask the question, you give them the answer. By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. So you want to know why I'm doing this? Here's the reason. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. That, dear son, is why you're here alive today. Why you can even ask me that question today. Because of what God did with Israel, who later is called his firstborn in the Old Testament. That's why I slay the firstborn of the animals, but I redeem the firstborn of my sons. Dear people, God teaches us lessons through the pictures that he gives to us. 
we have redemption through his blood, that is the blood of Christ, the one who is our lamb. Our time is up, but we have much more to say. Throughout the Old Testament, there's a striking emphasis on the firstborn. The firstborn is the beginning of the strength of a man's family. We find it in all kinds of prophetic words throughout the Old Testament. We find it stated that way in the law. We find firstborns who were defective and wicked and wretched and rebels. And we find what God did about it. But we'll have to save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you that Jesus is not only the firstborn among many brethren, but he is your only begotten son, your monogenes, the one who is unique. And yet he died for us that we might be called the sons of God also. You brought us into your family because of the death of the firstborn. What an incredible picture. We don't deserve it. And that yet you loved us while we were at sinners Christ died for us and has redeemed us unto God by his blood to receive honor and glory and power and riches and blessing even as you did with Israel honor and glory and power and riches and blessing and you provided it for us through the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world even Christ our Passover who has sacrificed for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 344, Grace Greater Than Our